Good afternoon, good morning, wherever you are in the world, the big, wide, bad world. <laughs> okay, this is Restoration Fellowship, special event, another Muslim Christian dialogue. So we, before we present uh, our guest tonight, let's see. So you are seeing the FocusOnTheKingdom.org website. This is our website, our ministry founded by Sir Anthony Buzzard. So you should be on the live stream if, if uh, you are seeing this and you want to watch this live. Actually, you're supposed to be watching this live. Uh, just uh, go to that link, click there, and refresh the page. The YouTube link might take a little while to, to kick up, but it should be up by this time. Let me just check before we go on. And then we'll introduce our guest. Yep, it should be up. So anyway, but if you're here, just type in your nickname and we'll be taking questions after the dialogue conversation between our two respective uh, conversationalists this evening. And uh, all right, so you can see us all there, I hope. So we have Sir Anthony Buzzard and Dr. Khalil Andani. I hope I'm saying your name right. So I'll read up a little bit about these two gentlemen. So Sir Anthony, of course, most of you know, if you follow us. He was born in, born in Surrey, England, educated at Oxford University, later at Bethany Theological Seminary. And uh, he holds master's degrees in theology, modern languages, he founded Restoration Fellowship in 1981. So Restoration Fellowship, just a squeak, a squeak, uh, sorry, squeak, a quick uh, sketch of our ministry. <clears throat> we are a non-Trinitarian ministry, and we are dedicated to recovering the beliefs of the first century disciples of Jesus. Uh, first and foremost, the gospel as the message about the coming kingdom of God on earth, as Jesus said in Mark 1, 14 and 15, and to propagate the non-Trinitarian creed uh, known as the Shema <clears throat> that Jesus himself cites in Mark 12, verse 29, and that's from the Old Testament, Deuteronomy 6, 4. So that's our prim primary focus, and that is Restoration Fellowship. Okay, so let me introduce Dr. Andani, and he is a Nizari Ismaili. A Muslim who holds a PhD in Islamic studies from Harvard University. He is currently assistant professor of religion at Augustana College, where he teaches college courses on Islamic history, thought, ethics. He also teaches Christian Muslim interactions, the study of religion, and comparative mysticism. Uh, Dr. Andani's public and academic talks can be viewed on his YouTube channel, and I'll just pull it up here, <clears throat> and there it is, or you can just search uh, his name, as you see there, Khalil Andani, and you'll see uh, uh, lots of uh, YouTube videos out there that he has done. So he's interested in uh, conversing further with us. I see that he's talked to some of uh, are other like-minded believers around the internet. So without further ado, Dr. Andani, you there? Yes, hi. Um, it's hi, uh, so, so I'll give you uh, 10, 15 minutes to give your little uh, presentation and uh, Anthony will then respond to Dr. Andani, and then they will take part in about a 30 minute or so worth of conversation. So please take it away. Great, great. So um, firstly, uh, thank you, Carlos, and thank you, Sir Anthony, for being with us and ta taking time uh, from your busy schedules. I know you guys do a lot online. Um, I just thought I'd, I'd begin by just saying sort of what my interest is in all this. So I, uh, the lot for the last 10 years or so have done the academic study of religion and Islam in, in particular. And I've always taken an interest in Christian Muslim dialogue. And as someone who studies uh, Islamic traditions, what's very obvious to me is that 
we talk about Islam as if it's one thing, and we talk about Christianity as if it's one thing. Uh, but at least on the side of Islam, which I'm more familiar with, uh, Islam is not one thing. Uh, there's actually many, many different Islams, and uh, these differ in creed, they differ in ritual, they differ in theology, they differ in ethics. And we sort of just lump all these things into one, and we have a tendency, this is all of us because we, you know, because of the internet and YouTube, uh, we often hear from what we call Islam, but it's actually one person's interpretation of Islam or one community's interpretation of Islam that we're actually hearing. Uh, so I just thought it would be beneficial um, to have this dialogue with you guys uh, so I could speak to some of the diversity that we have within Islam on these issues that Muslims and Christians agree and disagree on. And I think it's something that uh, a biblical Unitarian could be sympathetic to because uh, you would face the same issue where people think Christianity is the majority, whether it's Catholic or Orthodox or whatever the majority in the region is. Uh, people don't often think of biblical Unitarian Christianity as Christianity when they hear it. So it's the same in Christianity that there's a plurality of Christianities. So this is sort of where I'm coming from. And I just thought I'd begin by just quickly screen sharing here for you all. And uh, what you can see here, uh, if you can see my screen, there should be a, a diagram uh, that you see here. There, one, do you see that? Yep. So this is like a chart I made. And what you have here is different types of branches of Islam. Uh, the, the boxes that you see here, this is in terms of ritual and law. So there's all these different schools, Shia and Sunni. We, we often hear about Shia and Sunni only, but then each one has its own sub branches. And this, the, the, the green boxes are law, ritual, and creed. But then these, these words over here on the right, these are theological schools. So there isn't one Islamic theology, there's many different kinds. Uh, and different Muslims will subscribe to like one type of theology if they know about it, and then they'll practice one type of legal, ritual, creedal school. And depending on which combination you choose, you will get like a different view of Jesus. You'll get a different view of God. Uh, so that's sort of what I want to bring to this conversation. So when Christians say we're going to, what do we have in common with Muslims and where do we differ? One would really have to specify which Muslim. Are we talking about Sunni Muslims and then which Sunni theology? Are we talking about Sufi Sunni Muslims or non-Sufi? Are we talking about Shia Muslims? Because uh, you will find different views of Jesus and Muhammad and all this. Uh, the other thing I would mention is that if you're only looking at the Quran on its own, you will get a different meaning or a different set of meanings than if you're interpreting the Quran according to one of these traditions that you see. Um, I'll give you a couple examples uh, because some of these things, there's a certain issues that are like contentious, Muslims and Christians disagree about and stuff. So I'll give you a couple of examples of, of, of what, I, what I mean um, on this. So let's just take the term Islam. Like, what does the word Islam mean? So today, Islam is the name of a religion with, with boundaries, right? The boundaries usually believe in God and Muhammad as his messenger. Like, that's what Islam means. So anyone who says, God, I believe in God, one God, and Muhammad as his prophet, you're a Muslim. But in the Quran, the word Islam doesn't actually mean that. Like, in the Quran the word Islam simply means surrender to God. Uh, what, what Jesus in the gospel refers to is he who does the will of my father, right? So, um, and, and there's been academics who've studied like how, that's, how we know this is the case. So if you read the Quran by itself and you don't look at later Muslim interpretations, you sort of read the Quran on its own, sort of what biblical Unitarians do with the Bible. If you read the Bible through the, uh, fourth century creeds, you'll get one meaning. But if you read the Bible through first century ideas, you'll get a different meaning. So we can do the same with the Quran. And even the word Islam, it simply means monotheistic tradition in the Quran. So when Muhammad talks about Islam, 
with, you could say, a small i. He's just talking about this perennial idea of monotheism, which is faith in God, obedience to God through the guidance God has sent down to humans. And that guidance, Muslims believe that, uh, you know, God has given that guidance through many, many different figures throughout history. Every community received divine guidance about the one God, how to live ethically, how to, how to submit oneself to the one God. And the Quran itself acknowledge, acknowledges, uh, in, in Surah 5, it says, to each we have given a law and a way. So it acknowledges that different people were given different guidance on how to submit to the one God. Um, but this is important because the seventh century you could say Quranic, you guys use the term biblical, you could say the Quranic meaning of Islam is this universal monotheistic tradition. And from that perspective, the message of Muhammad is just an, is an instance of that. The message that Muhammad taught was for the, his people in the seventh century, it was, ta it was this universal monotheism, but tailored to that context. Seventh century Arabia, a pagan environment, which also had Jews and Christians. And you could say that the, the true message of Judaism, however we want to define that, right, is another instance. And sort of like the core of Christianity is another instance. So this is sort of the context that someone like me is approaching. And this is why dialogue is important, because um, if I'm a believer in Muhammad's message, which later gets called Islam, right? So then the meaning of Islam changes you could say the small I becomes a capital I. And now Islam means the religion of Muhammad. And in a sense, that's natural. This happens to all religions, right? A, a universal idea becomes institutionalized. But the point is that if you go to this original 7th century Quranic idea of Islam, that would mean those who believe in Muhammad could learn a lot from those who believe in Moses and Jesus. And that's why dialogue uh, can be, you know, is very important. And Another quick example, when it, uh, I'll focus on Jesus specifically, um, but this idea of the, the crucifixion. So you heard from other, I'm sure you guys have heard from many, many people that the Quran says Jesus was not crucified. Uh, I'm sure you've, you've heard this. And this is, this, is, this is the majority Muslim belief. We have to acknowledge that most Muslims believe this, but the basis for that belief is not the Quran alone. It's the Quran being interpreted through extra Quranic material called hadiths, often which contain later stories that circulated uh, from what you could say fringe Jewish Christian ideas. So this idea that Jesus did not get put on the cross, that someone else was turned into Jesus' form and he was put on the cross, most Muslims do believe in this, but the, the Quran doesn't say that. It's additional oral traditions, sort of word of mouth ideas that from outside the Quran that circulated maybe you know 150 years after the Quran, that's where that belief comes from. And I would propose to you um, that if you compare what the Quran actually says with the book of Acts, you will find agreement. So here's what I mean. So these are the verses right here that most Muslims today will turn to and, and you'll hear it in your dialogues that, oh, look, the Quran says, as for their saying, we killed the Messiah, Jesus, son of Mary, messenger of God. And then the Quran says they did not kill him, nor did they crucify him, but it was made to appear to them. It doesn't say he was made to appear. To them. It says it was made to appear to them. Now, the question is this, what do the verses right before say? Because who is the they? Like, which group is the they that boasted that they killed the Messiah? Because the Quran is denying that they killed him. So if you actually read the Quran holistically, and we look at the verses right before, the Quran is talking about a group of Israelites, just a group, not all of them, a group of Israelites who disobeyed God habitually. So it talks about this group of people, and, and the Torah contains the same critique of certain Israelites who, who broke the covenant of God. So the Quran is criticizing this group, and look at the, the pronouns, them, there. So this group is being chastised, and then this group claimed that they, this group of Israelites claimed to have killed Jesus. So Jesus' enemies, Jesus' opponents claimed to have killed him. And the Quran says, no, they did not kill him. So then 
did Jesus actually die? Well, in two other verses, the Quran says that God caused Jesus to die. Twice it says that. It says God God caused Jesus to die. Some one time it's in first person. God says to Jesus, I will cause you to die and raise you to myself. It doesn't even say raise you to heaven. It says, God says to Jesus, raise you to me. Right? So that's what the Quran says. So the Quran, I would propose, you don't have to agree with me, and, and most Muslims won't agree with me based on their own traditions, but from a Quranic perspective, the Quran is denying the agency of Jesus' enemies to have killed him, and it's saying, no, it was God's will that Jesus died. And I'll, I'll end off by simply saying that um, if you compare this to Acts, Acts chapter 2, uh, Peter is preaching, and Peter basically says, he, again, he's, crit he's critiquing Jesus' enemies among the Israelites, but Jesus, uh, Peter says that Jesus was handed over to you by God's deliberate plan and foreknowledge, right? And that yeah, you put him on the cross, but this is actually God's will that it happened. So I would argue that here the, the two scriptures are actually in agreement. The Quran is not denying Jesus' crucifixion. It is denying the claim of certain enemies of Jesus. And I'll simply add at the end that we do know that the Talmud, which was compiled a century before Muhammad and the Quran come about, the Talmud claims that, according to some rabbis, that the rabbis executed and tried Jesus and stoned him. So the, some rabbis, we don't know who they are, but they boasted that they killed Jesus and they slandered Mary. They said Mary is like a harlot or something. So the Quranic verse that you see on the right is that seems to be a direct response to the Talmud because it defends Mary as well uh, in this section. So, so that's what, uh, you know, th that's, that's just one example of how if you sort of dig deep a little bit, uh, we will find a little more agreement than we think on Christian Muslim dialogue. So thank you. Uh, thank you, Dr. Andani. Can you tell us, uh, before Anthony uh, engages with you, can you tell us a little bit more about your, your particular group or sect of, uh, is, um, I believe uh, you pronounce it Smiley? Yes, Smiley, yes, yes. Okay, please tell us a, a little bit of history on that. Sure, sure. Um, so very, very quickly, uh, Ismailis are a uh, branch of Shia Islam. Um, I could even uh, possibly, if I can find it quickly here, I could bring up a, um, a diagram for you in a minute. So here we go. I'll put this up. So here, um, if you can follow this, the black is Sunni and the blue is Shia. So Shia Muslims differ from Sunni Muslims based on who is the rightful divinely appointed leader after Muhammad. The Sunnis say that no leader was appointed. So the community can choose its own leadership. That's what the Sunni belief is. The Shia belief is that Muhammad passed on his divine authority to his cousin and son-in-law, Ali, right here. Sorry, uh, you stopped sharing your screen. Oh, my bad. Let Go me... ahead. Put it back. All right, so now you should see it. So you have the Sunni view in the black and then the Shia in the blue. So as I said, the Sunnis believe that when Muhammad passes away, the leadership of the community and the right to interpret Islam is up to the community as a whole that the community can choose its political leader, it can choose its religious leader. So in the Sunni world, there is no church, like there's no Pope-like figure. Um, there are multitude of Sunni scholars who interpret law and ritual. And for the longest time, the Sunnis had a caliph and the caliph often was the person who, the empire that seized power, you know, for a few centuries. So that's the Sunni view. The Shia view is that Muhammad appointed his cousin and son-in-law Ali, the closest member of his family, his blood, to be the divinely ordained leader after him. Uh, so 
the Shia then believe that that leadership, this is the right to interpret Islam. This is the right to guide people by God's will, that that passed on through the direct descendants of Ali. So from Ali to Ali's son, and then to his son and to his son. And eventually what happens is the Shia disagree, well, who's the, the next leader? And these people are called Imams. So there's a schism here among the Shia Majority of the Shia are in the black here, which are called Twelvers, because they only believe in a total of 12 leaders, 12 Imams. And that the last Imam of the Twelvers disappeared in the year 874, and they wait, they wait for him to come back. He's like the Messiah. But another group of the Shia, the Ismailis, followed another lineage of leaders. Again, all, it goes back to Ali, but through a different line. And most Ismailis today are Nizari Ismailis, and they follow a living leader, a living imam. So this person, whose name is the Aga Khan, he's a direct descendant of Ali. And he's somewhat similar to the Pope, but still quite different. You know, he's not elected by anybody. He's appointed each leader imam, appoints one of their sons as the next imam. And the powers of the Shia imam go far beyond the powers of the Pope, for example. Um, so for ex oh. a, a very quick thing, and this will mm -hmm. connect to, to how BUs see Jesus. For Shia Muslims, these Imams, they are Christ-like figures from a Unitarian perspective. So they are the mediators of, between man and God. They are the intercessors. They bear some of God's qualities in a reflected manner. Uh, so Shia Muslims pray to the Imams for help. Uh, they call the imams Lord, you know, there's an Arabic term. So this is all stuff we could talk about, but it's important to mention because when you, if you dialogue with a Sunni and you should, of course, you won't get this perspective. In a sense, a Shia Muslim can sympathize a little and empathize a little bit more with the Christian reverence for Jesus, because in the Shia tradition, you have this reverence for a, a, a human being. All right, thank you very much. So we'll start the conversation stage. Anthony, unmute yourself, please, and go ahead. Well, that's extremely eye-opening because uh, I had assumed with my very small amount of knowledge of the Quran that the idea that Jesus was crucified was just wrong. It didn't happen historically. This is the public view, I'm sure, shared by many. So that's eye-opening. Of course, we would then want to go on from our point of view and say, what was the meaning of that crucifixion in terms of theology? And there, that's that whole thing about the atoning sacrifice, the substitutionary atonement, which we personally believe in some Unitarians didn't. So that at least, though, would lead to a more easily accessible dialogue. I'm sure you found that um, in terms of your Christian interaction. So that's good. Can we turn to asking you a little bit about the virgin birth? When I spoke with the other Muslim the other night, I was actually quite impressed at the degree of, of uh, unanimity on Mary having conceived supernaturally. Uh, I think there's a whole lot of nonsense about, well, God had sex with Mary. None of us please that. We think that's silly. That's probably a popular fiction among some Islamic people. But if I were to say that a miracle occurred in the womb of Mary, that Jesus was fathered in the womb, ennafti in the Greek there, in her, that's what makes her the son of God for us. We, of course, as Unitarians, have an enormous Unitarian thrust with you. I was actually very excited by that Muslim I spoke to the other night. We are tortured almost by the fact that Christians can say, we're following Jesus, but you're not. So our thesis, which is open, of course, to discussion in every possible way, is that a Christian is one who follows the teaching of Jesus. And again, we hear the Muslim people saying, well, that's what we talk about Muhammad and following his teachings. But if you, I'm sure you know this, uh, Kali, but if you find uh, uh, theological books in the, in the dispensationalist line, you'll be astonished. And you will tell your students this, I'm sure. Christians, in fact, don't think that the teaching of Jesus is for us. It's for Jews. It doesn't get any worse than that from our point of view. I want, to, I want to hear where we're coming from. So we start with the Shema. We actually make little uh, copies of the Shema. We have them on our, on our mantelpieces. And that's a very heartening idea. So simple. 
But the Lord our God is one Lord. We stress the word echad. We tell a story of the Jew who died with the word echad. You know it well, of course, Rabbi Akiba. I find that very exciting. So just in two sentences, my background is Church of England. And here I'm going to be humorous about the Georgia style of speaking. We didn't know nothing about nothing. I'm not, I'm not lying to you. You know this as a professor of religion. We went to church every Sunday and the buildings were beautiful and the sermon was 10 minutes, but we had nothing by way of biblical education. And we were, quote, the best sort of education you could get. We didn't know anything. So I've spent the last 60 years, nearly 60 years, 55 years, pondering what did it mean when I went forward to a, a get saved meeting and I asked Jesus into my heart. That's the Billy Graham style, not wanting to be hard on anybody. But I think that Islamic people would understand our concern about how vague that is. How do, you, how do I ask somebody into my heart? Makes no sense at all to me. You either listen to the teachings, the obedience of faith, Paul's phrase, or you don't. So we're rather uh, Islamic oriented in that way, I think, from the point of view, what is faith and how do you become a believer? You've got to obey Jesus and you start with the gospel and you start with the Shema. Now that's to cause you to be an unspeakable heretic in the evangelical world. And we've been cursed up and down. I'm not, you know, in America where the law protects us. But as you well know, if you say Jesus isn't God, you're entirely beyond the pale. You just aren't a Christian. You're not facing, if I understand you rightly, quite that degree of division in your divided Islamic faith. Am I right? It's not quite that severe. Do you excommunicate each other on those things, differences or not? <laughs> I don't think you do. <laughs> I'm wondering how that works. Well, uh, just the last thing you said. So yeah. the thing about uh, the case of Islam is um, they, because there, it, it didn't start with this like one super powerful church. Right. Right. So uh, yes. excommunication is not really a thing. Now, what you do have is you could have an, a Muslim individual who is mm -hmm. learned, who issues an opinion that says, I think yeah. this group is outside Islam. Yes. But okay. that was that would just be his opinion, mm -hmm. and it would be what I it, the, the term is fatwa, and fatwa yes. actually means unenforceable opinion. Okay, right. That's good. Yeah, so that's I didn't what know you that. have in in Muslim law, yeah. um, and, and a person, and, and there's opinions over all sorts of matter, like oh, I, yeah. you know, what's the right way to pray, and uh, am I yes. allowed to? Do I have to? When do I need to uh, cleanse my body? You know, and yeah. Things, so you could go fatwa shopping, right? Like you could ask a hundred Muslim jurists, like what's the answer to my question? Yes. So you don't have that level of excommunication, but you do have cases, and 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 maybe uh, this somewhat relates to the biblical Unitarians. Uh, mm. Maybe it doesn't, but you have mm. cases where groups like the Ismailis were persecuted by the political uh, okay. entity, okay, empire, because. Mm. If you if if you have a Muslim group that says, "Look, our hereditary leader is the true leader of Muslims," mm -hmm. then the actual caliph or sultan who's ruling the land will say, "Well, these guys are a bunch of traitors." Yes. Okay. So you have that type. Yes. Of that, okay. It was more politically motivated. It's less yes. motivated. Well, I want to echo entirely your your feelings about the divisions in Islam. I didn't know that the chart is brilliant. I'd have to go and study that. I see entirely now there's a great deal of uh, disagreement. You do know that in the Christian world, there are, what, 80,000 different denominations, you know that. This is very challenging to any of us who teach the biblical languages. If you've got any thinking going at all, you're gonna say, how did this happen? How is it that our apostle Paul, whom we treat as very important authority, he says, I wish above all things, brothers and sisters, that you all say the same thing, be perfectly united. Will we patently or not? So I'm now, after 60 years, I, I was at 20 that I got my got saved experience. And I went back to my Oxford room and I said, what does this mean? I'm still pondering that with great enthusiasm, enthusiasm and interest now. And what it doesn't mean is you ask Jesus into your heart biblically. I think the Islamic people would hear our language much more uh, interestedly if we say, no, you've got to obey the teachings of Jesus. 
So we quote the verses like Hebrews 5, 9 says that salvation, high tension word, is given to those who obey Jesus. Come on, what, what don't you understand about that? Oh no, Luther, you see, has done irreparable damage to our uh, historical sense because here he's saying one of the worst things he ever said was the book of Revelation is not a Christian book. What? Not a Christian book. Now, eventually he thought it might be slightly, but Calvin was, from our angle, a murderer. Servetus was burned at the stake on the use of the Trinity. I mean, this is unthinkably bad. I can understand the atheist or the agnostic wanting to have nothing to do with any of this. I'm making sense, I hope, from so our biblical... What, what would you, it sounds like the type of uh, salvation theology yeah. that you espouse yeah. is very close to the book of James. You're absolutely right. We'd be cl absolutely, the language would be closer to James. Absolutely. Uh, I'll refer to the popular evangelical system as roughly the Billy Graham scheme, which as you, I'm sure know, Jesus says Billy Graham came to do three days work. Three mm -hmm. days work. Right. For us, I, I, I don't want to be mean to anybody, but that is an absolute falsehood because what it does is skip over the teaching ministry of Jesus. And so the creed, I'm going to be talking to some very fundamentalist evangelicals tomorrow as it happens, and they are going to give me the apostolic creed, the apostles' creed. And that gives me exactly the in that I need. And I'm going to say, what about the apostle Jesus? People don't know that in Hebrews, Jesus is called an apostle. You knew that, I'm sure. Mm. The apostle Jesus had a creed. So let's talk about that. So our simplicity is simply for us. You've got to go back to the teachings of Jesus. And if you don't do that, according to 1 Timothy 6, 3, 2 John 7, it's Antichrist. And we're talking serious stuff here. Those two apostles for us, John and, 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 Tim and Paul, are, are warning against that tendency. So how do you, um, maybe you can explain to me, so the, yeah. what I hear, and again, like I said, you know, there's a loud Islam that you see about on YouTube, right? Yes. The, all the debaters that you hear about, they all represent this loud Islam, which is a very simplified notion of Islam. It ignores all the complexity yeah. that I've mentioned. Got it. Yeah. I also hear loud Christianity. Yes, you now, do. Now, I'm not one to say what's true or false as an academic. No, no, that's fine. My, my goal is to properly represent. Of course. Right? Um, so, and that includes, so what I've done for my classes, I, I had a dialogue with Sam. Uh, Sam, you know Sam, he's on that. Shamoon? No, 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 no. This was a, a biblical Unitarian Sam. I, I don't use his full oh. name because he doesn't want his full name, but okay. it's on YouTube. So yeah, yeah. I did a dialogue with him and, I, and that was the required lecture for my students in my class because yes. I want them yes. to learn about Christianities, yes. right? Cause there's, so the question I have for you, uh, yeah. the, the Christianity that we often hear about that is what you call Billy Graham. And again, like, yeah. I'm not here to judge whether it's true or false, no, no. but yeah. what I hear is this idea of, accept Jesus as your personal savior. Right. That's and then language. you don't, you don't sort of actually have to do any works um, in a sense, like fall, you don't really have to follow X, Y, and Z for salvation. Right. That's right. Now the often, of course, when you ask, well, well, how is this the case? And if you hear William Lane Craig and all them, they'll all say that, well, look, Jesus paid the price yep. on the cross. Right this substitutionary atonement. Yeah, now, guess. to me, like, it makes sense that if you have the atonement on the cross, I can yes. see how it makes sense within the system that well, the works don't make a difference. But yes. you seem to accept both. So how does how do Absolutely. both of those work together? Because um, it yeah. seems like it's presented as it's either one or the other. Right. Yep. So how, how does it work for you guys, for, for a biblical yes. Unitarian that you have both? Why is the atonement um, yes. necessary if you still have to obey uh, the teachings, as you said? Yeah, no, it's a, it's a very, very good question. Because without obedience, there's no salvation. You start with those sort of texts. Jesus keeps saying, if you love me, you're going to do what I say. Keep my commandments. Is that doing something? He doesn't come into Galilee, Mark 1, say, and say, I'm going to preach the gospel of the kingdom. You all repent and believe I died for your sins. So when I teach these classes, we start by saying, Jesus didn't say anything about his death until about two-thirds of the way through the ministry. 
So what's that gospel preaching, which is not about the cross? I mean, it's a very simple idea. We're simply suggesting, we're not making ultimate judgments about, you know, who gets saved, that, that's not our business. But we're pointing out that it's wrong to say that Jesus dying and rising is the totality of the gospel. But in that system, the, I'll call it loosely the Billy Graham system, that is what has happened. You might call it the gap in the gospel. It's very easy to show that in any Christian book that you pick up, how to be born again. You won't find Luke 4.43. Now, you don't need to know that verse, but my students have to. That says, I came to preach the gospel of the kingdom. That's why God commissioned me. Isn't that easy? I didn't learn this in church. So I'm thinking, what, what happened? Well, the clergy didn't know it either. Well, interestingly, this idea of gospel, yes. what you just said, Mm. that's the gospel that the Quran talks about. Yes. So the Quran says, yeah. that, and, and, and we have to be very clear what the Quran says. The Quran yeah. defines gospel. It doesn't define gospel as a series of books. No, no. Well, that's, that's common ground. It doesn't that's define common. gospel as four gospels. No, no, no. Of course not. And that's the correct, Quran says that God taught Jesus the gospel. Ah. Jesus taught taught the gospel to his people. That's what the Quran says. So yes. whatever gospel means in the Quranic view, yes. it's yes. the message that Jesus taught. You could call yes. it the Jesus teaching. And what I find very interesting is, again, I'm not in the debate circuit, so I don't do this, but in the debate circuit, many um, often Protestant debaters will tell Muslims that, look, the Quran says, you know, follow the gospel, but the New Testament is the gospel. Ergo, the Quran says, follow the New Testament. But my, and, and it's been lost on everybody that when the Quran says gospel, it's talking about what you're talking about. Yes. What it? did Jesus okay. say? Right? right. What did he teach? Right. And, and um, I think you, you're making a very valid point. Yes. Uh, but how, now, how did we get from this idea from gospel of the kingdom, which yes. then becomes whatever Paul calls, calls gospel, Paul refers to something like my gospel. And then from, from that, you have four gospels, right? Yes. Like the gospel about the good news about Jesus, yes. as opposed to the good news of Jesus. Yes. And then, so then the term gospel also gets used for the entire scripture, like yes. as a whole. So how, yes. how, do, how does this even happen? How do you get this like snowballing well, of meaning on this? Yeah, term? because uh, our sense is that, that we, the public, my dad was the director of naval intelligence. So we were brought up to say, most people are getting nearly everything wrong all the time. I mean, it's rather a cynical thing to say, but we were supposed to think about what's being said. And as a language person, we share that interest. The, the words are so vague as to be manipulable in many directions. So when they say gospel now, they mean Jesus died and rose. Three days work, Billy Graham sums it up well. And I'm saying, what happened to Jesus? So we insist on the subject of genitive there, the gospel as preached by Jesus. And if you lose that, we really think you're, you're threatening the whole faith. Now, I'm not saying it doesn't work for people. People are very good. They're morally good and upright. There's a lot of very fine people believing all sorts of different things. But if you want to tackle the New Testament, you have to start by saying that Paul and Jesus preached the same gospel. And you do that by linking with the book of Acts. So we spend a lot of our time with the eight kingdom texts in Acts, where Paul is preaching exactly the same kingdom of God gospel. So Jesus and Paul are on the same track. Paul had developed some things that Jesus didn't. I get that. So our key text in Acts, I'll just give you this one in, in this segment. It's in Acts 20, verses 24 and 25, where Paul is there talking to pastors and summarizing his own career. And he says, I went about preaching the gospel of the grace of God. And all the evangelists saying, hallelujah, wonderful, we love it. But the very next verse says, and as I went about preaching the kingdom gospel, and you will hear evangelical lectures not even mention that verse. So there's a kind of antipathy, a sort of immunity in evangelicalism, I'm suggesting, mm. against the idea of doing any works. And repentance would be a work. We couldn't do that. Baptism, I mean, that's a work. So we are strongly in favor of obedience as being part of faith. Hence, the obedience of faith, which frames Romans 1 and Romans 16. I mean, I think you see what we're getting at very easily. 
So this this is very interesting because this is a point of of uh, more commonality uh, between yes, the je- the Quranic view Absolutely. and your view. So Absolutely. um what you'll find uh in the Quran there's a reef it's almost like a chorus. Uh so when when the um when the Quran talks about salvation in in numerous contexts the chorus message uh that you hear <laughs> is uh those who have faith and do good works of course together it's it's always linked like those who have faith in god and yes. who do good works they will be in paradise they of will course. be in gardens they will be rewarded by their lord and many scholars i don't know what your opinion on james tabor's work is i know james he's, tabor he's made that connection between I mean, so he has a different view than you, but he's made this yeah. connection between what he calls uh, Jamesian Christianity mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Uh, and the Quran. That the ethic, the overall salvation ethic, yeah. is the same between the two yeah. because the Quran's position is not—it's not grace alone, but it's yeah. not works only. It's both yeah. together, right? Faith and works. They, they're like married. Um, so James Tabor has noted this. He's also yes. noted that the. The Gentile, you know, in the book of Acts, I think it's the book mm-hmm. of Acts where there's a dispute over how much law do the, the Gentile uh, Christians mm-hmm. have to follow. Mm-hmm. And the, the, the James gives a decree, right? And it's a bunch of dietary. It's just some dietary yes. laws. Yes. So, so Tabor has also argued um, that mm-hmm. the Quranic dietary law is identical. To yes. That. So you have this, this continuity um, and yes. some scholars have debated uh, is there a Jewish Christian? So we have we have little evidence. Did this sort of Jewish Christian Unitarian Christianity survive? Yeah, it's a good question, right? It, like, historically, and there's a debate because mm. you see many core features of Unitarian Christianity, with some differences, of mm. course, but many features of that belief system mm-hmm. in the Quran. Yeah, but. We cannot locate, based on our evidence, a distinct community, Unitarian Christian community. Okay. And yet there's some continuity. Yes. So, so this has puzzled many scholars. So now there's yes. a search for the, Jew, the, the so-called Jewish Christian. Like, did they, right. where are they, were they in Arabia? Or are they in Syria? Yes. And so on. So you have this um, yes. connection. There's one other thing I want to show you, because you've talked about the Shema, and, and I think you'll like this. Um, <laughs> So I, I'm going to, I'm going to show this to you. I'm going to um, screen share it. If, yeah. if, uh, if that's okay. Yeah. Very, very quickly. Again, no, it's important. So um, what you have in the Quran, there's something very, very interesting uh, that we will see. Mm. So if I'm just going to uh, quickly um, bring it up here. Uh, give me one second. Okay, here we go. Okay. So, and I'll just screen share so everyone can see this. Mm. All right. So, uh, in the Quran, Mm -hmm. there's a verse that basically Muslims recite every time they pray. Every Muslim prayer uh, has a certain verse of the Quran. Okay. And it's this verse, which I've translated into Mm -hmm. English. This Mm -hmm. is called uh, Surat al-Ikhlas. Yes. And the word ikhlas means purity. Okay. So this idea where you're declaring the nature of God in, you know, pure of any contamination. Mm-hmm. So if you read this, it says in English, say, so people like say he is God, wow. the one. And of course, as you know, the Arabic word Allah mm-hmm. simply means the God. Yes. It's not a personal name of some other God, no, no. you know, so Allah just means the God. So it says, say he yeah. is God, the unique mm-hmm. God is absolute self-sufficient. He did not beget, nor is he begotten. Mm-hmm. And there's none like unto him. Now the context of this is very interesting because mm-hmm. you have Surah al class here. I've just split it up into mm-hmm. lines that you can, you can see this, right? Yes. Now what's happening is this, Quranic verse. Remember, this is around the seventh century, mm-hmm. right? So the idea of begotten is yep. the dominant idea in at this time in the Byzantine yes. theology, right? Okay. Byzantine and Syriac Christianity. Begotten doesn't mean what you said. Mm-hmm. It means 
eternally begotten. Ah, eternally right? begotten. Yes. That, that's what the word means in this seventh century context. Right. right. So the Quran is, is actually compare Surat al-Ikhlas with the Nicene Constantinople Creed. Yes. What you're finding is a, the Quran is in dialogue with that creed. Okay. It's agreeing with, the, with parts of it. It's modifying the second part of it. So it yes. doesn't want to call God the Father. Right. Because that's, it, con, it has this connotation now of yes. the Father eternally begets. Yes. So the Quran is saying we'll call God Samad, which means the absolute. Yes. Right. And then the third line is the direct disagreement with the Nicene Creed. Mm-hmm. Right. Lord mm-hmm. Jesus Christ begotten before all the worlds. And then finally, um, if you look at the end, and at the beginning, you have this word ahad. See that? What what word did you say from the Shema earlier? The word for one in Hebrew, echad. So that's the same word. Exactly. It's the exact same word. Yes. Just translated in a different language. Absolutely. So what's going on here is... The Quran is restoring, in its own context, the Shema. Mm-hmm. Some, mm-hmm. as some scholars have argued. Yeah, well, that would make sense. Yeah, the key well, I to this. I thought I'd share yeah, that. Absolutely, but you've 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 actually hit on the most significant point. If you're talking about begetting eternally, we non-Trinitarians say that's just not even language that's comprehensible. You cannot have, as one of the Church Fathers said, a beginningless beginning. So we, as language people particularly, say, you ask me to believe in eternal begetting is to ask me to believe something that's not comprehensible. It's just not coherent. Adam Clark even said it's completely incoherent. And many of the Trinitarian scholars in the evangelical world, Erickson, Millard Erickson, for example, doesn't believe in that thing at all. Hmm. So if you're telling me that the Quran will allow God to beget, not in an eternal sense, it will let him be father of the son, in the womb of Mary, is that conceivable for the Quran? Or let's, let's talk about that. So I've heard you say this before, and I'm going to ask you to repeat. Yeah. Um, you've talked about the meaning of this Greek term "begotten" before. Yes. Do you mind repeating it? Like, what does if bego- yes. if "begotten" does not mean biological begotten, yes. and if it does not mean eternal begetting, how, what does it mean? Well, it, it does mean uh, biological begetting. Yinome Yen, is the Greek verb for, and I'm using the modern Greek pronunciation because we do that, and they're doing it at Harvard, by the way, so we're pleased to do it following their example. Yinome is, is to become, is to be. To be. But the co- to be, to exist, to be. Yeah, just to be or become. But the causative form of that is yenao, yenao, that's G-E-N-N-A-O. That mm-hmm. means to cause to be. To cause to come into existence. And okay. That is what a father does when he begets a child. So, I mean, would it be agony for, for any Islamic people to countenance the idea that the son was begotten in the womb of Mary? That's what Matthew one twenty says. So let, let's, again, I'll ask you to repeat this because it's very, very important. Yes. Can you just say again the causative form in yes. the Greek and translate it? Absolutely. The causative form of the verb to be, which is yinome, to be or become, I'd call it yinome. Okay. And the causative form, i.e. to cause to be, to cause to come into existence. Okay. To cause to exist is yenao, G-E-N-N-A-O. And in Matthew one twenty, hiding in our translations, by the way, this is another subject, but our translations tend to push everything in the terms of Trinitarianism, that's another thing we can talk about. But in Matthew one twenty, it isn't just that Mary conceived. She did, mm-hmm. of course, conceive. But in Matthew one twenty, the Greek actually says that what is begotten in her, fathered in her, is from the Holy Spirit. That's a huge difference. Now, she did conceive. But right. you see, the, the Trinitarian world translates the Bibles. And so some of us who are trying to get this right, uh, trying to straighten out some of these mistranslations, which tend in the direction of Trinitarianism wherever they can. Okay, so I, I, I made a point of this, yeah. um, and this is very, very important because I want to answer your question yeah. very, um, very, very, you know, in, in detail. 
Yes, of course. So, so I, I'm going to throw something on the screen. Yeah. I think it's still sharing, right? So this is a verse of the Quran. There's a, numerous translations here. This is saying, this is in the Quran, Surah mm -hmm. 3. Mm -hmm. And let's uh, look just to, excuse me, just to remind our, our listeners, if you want to want to ask a question, post it in the chat. Yeah. And um, we got around 10 minutes to go, and then we'll ask some questions. Thank you. Go ahead, please, doctor. All right. So uh, there's like several translations here. They're all pretty much the same. But this basically says, uh, if we read the last one here, Arbery. Arbery is pretty good. The likeness of Jesus in God's sight is as Adam's likeness. Yeah. This is echoing Paul. Oh, yeah. Right? Yeah. Second Adam. Second, very much so. Right? God created him from dust and said to him, be, Got and it. he was. Now, the Arabic is, so God says kun, God imperative. God says be. be. And then it says fayakun in Arabic. That's the present tense. And Jesus became. Wonderful. The Arabic verb, the infinitive form mm. of the verb, causative, be, mm. is takween. Mm -hmm. Takween. Mm -hmm. And some scholars, like my, uh, my colleague, uh, Abdullah Galadari, he has a yeah. book that you can find online. It's called Quranic Hermeneutics and the yeah. Bible. Yeah. Uh, it's open access, so you, anyone can read it. Mm -hmm. But Abdullah Galadari has pointed to this and then the Greek that you mentioned. And he yes. said, guys, it's the same, it's the same verb. Wonderful. It's I the same it. verb, to be. So yes. Um, yes. It, it would be totally fine if begotten means what you said yes the causative form to be that's yes. literally what the quran says god made jesus become in the and, womb of mary well that's exactly what biblical unitarians subscribe to but it's the eternal generation of a region that for us wrecks everything not only because the words are not coherent they don't mean anything Mm -hmm. But that then dehumanizes Jesus, you see, where you're going to turn and say, you must have Jesus as a human being, albeit supernaturally conceived. Right. There he, then he's the second Adam. I'll just throw in one name the public will be aware of, I'm sure. That's James Dunn, who died recently. You've heard of him, I'm sure. James Dunn, in his last book about did the early Christians worship Jesus, says, in the New Testament, Jesus is not Yahweh, is not God. And we're thinking, wow, that is so heartening for us minority biblical Unitarians. My cousin John A.T. Robinson at Cambridge was saying the same thing in the 80s, by the way, and trying to persuade Dunn. And Dunn eventually came around to what I would call the biblical Unitarian point of view. And there it is, in one of the greatest minds in Christology in our, in our time. So that's very exciting for us. You know, we don't want to be loners on the side. Let me ask you, uh, so you mentioned yeah. James Dunn. I want to ask you a question. Yeah. So, he wrote an article about, it's a book chapter, about how did the earliest Christians understand uh, Jesus' death? Yes, I'm not so much familiar with that aspect, but tell, tell me about it. So it, mm. I, have the, I have a copy. I mean, I can mm. send it to you. It, it's, mm. in a, it's an edited volume. But he basically mm -hmm. argued that the yeah. Hebrew Christians, yeah. the Jewish Christians, yeah. Yeah. they didn't understand Jesus' death as an atonement, but they understood it as a covenant sacrifice. I see. So like what the pass the Passover sacrifice, for example, yeah. is actually like covenant blood, mm -hmm. right? To sort of yeah. like to sanctify the new covenant. Yeah. And he suggested then that the the idea that it's a payment for sin mm -hmm. uh, seems to come from more like Hellenized. Um, That's interesting. So I I just thought I because you throw that in none, absolutely so yeah. How uh, do you see that? Do you see yeah. like a covenant thing going on too? Well, I see that, but I don't think the substitution element needs to be eliminated. That would be the difference. The Socinians, who were the biblical Unitarians, as you know, in the 1600s, they didn't like the substitution atonement. I'm stuck with the text in Mark, which says that he died anti in our place, mm -hmm. and uh, God has laid on him the sins of all of us in Isaiah. So. I don't, I go, don't get into the detail of that, but I'm, I'm thrilled and interested to know that James Dunn had analyzed that for us. Now, the last thing I wanted to ask you yeah. is, we've talked about agreements, we've mm. seen several agreements, but I want to yeah. ask you about this. Now, Christians, I, you know, James Dunn would also agree, and Hurtado, that there's cultic worship towards Jesus, yeah. right? You pray to Jesus, you ask yeah. for his help. Um, there are Yahweh texts, applied to jesus right no divine, 
Uh, so how, how does that work now where you don't believe in his divinity? Um, how, how do you maintain a sort of monotheism, but you have a secondary figure who's the object of worship? And I'm asking because this happens on the Muslim side too. You never hear about yeah. it, but we, we have this in our tradition, yeah. but I want to hear from you. Um, yes, thank you. Trinitarian thing. Right. It's a great question. Part of the trouble is simply language one, that in our American English, we talk about worship meaning to deity. We try to avoid the word divinity because it's a fog term. You know, all sorts of things can be divine. We avoid that. If you're talking about big deity for Jesus, we're against it, obviously. But the word worship is a hopeless muddle in American and British English because you can worship David. They did in the Old Testament. You know, this, uh, this verb is used for the worship of God and David alongside him. You can worship the saints. So it's a language model on a grand scale that has to be, to be worked out. If you're talking about worshiping Jesus as God, we're dead against it. If you're talking about worshiping Jesus as Messiah, as in Revelation chapter 5, we're in favor. And you can pray to Jesus in John 14. So now some of your Unitarians talking about the splitting in the Unitarian field don't think you can do that. You know, there's a, a sort of minor fight going on. And we say, no, you can pray to Jesus. If you can ask Jesus when he was on the earth to come and heal you or give you a sight back, you mean you can't speak to him now? That makes no sense to us. So that's our personal view. The majority of you would be what I'm giving you. So there. how, how if, so right now, if he's not on earth and you ask Jesus mm. for help and mm. you're, you're facing a tough yes. time, how that's does right. he help then? Like when he's not here physically, does he have a spiritual <laughs> type of help? That it's, a great, it's a great question. John 14, he says, I'm leaving now, but I'm not going to leave you as orphans. I'm coming back. What? How are you leaving and coming back? Quite simply, he comes back in spirit. So we believe in the spirit of Jesus, which is indistinguishable from the spirit of God for us. And we can pray to both. I most prayers to the Father through the Messiah. We understand that. But Jesus is a spiritual force because he's the parakletos, the comforter. And he's actually said to be the Parakletos in First John two one. Right. So that's I mean it takes a bit of sorting out. Certainly in my Church of England days we didn't study this. You see, we didn't work this out or discuss it, so we didn't understand it. But I don't think it's so bad. So he's back with us in spirit, not leaving us as orphans. But he's not physically here on the earth with us now. So he, you could say that Jesus in the form of of the Spirit. Yes, absolutely. Is, is sort of guiding absolutely ask for his help he can hear absolutely. that would be our, th our theory absolutely um we're not as quote charismatic as some of the pentecostals you know everything they say is a direct inspiration we're not in that sort of line mm. but we're certainly believing that jesus answers prayer in fact that's one of our excited things about christianity so you know the spirit of messiah guided them in the book of acts Right. I don't think you could distinguish between the effects. We, just, we, we define the spirit. I like this definition from one of the big dictionaries. It is the operational presence and power of God or Jesus indistinguishably manifesting itself in various ways. That works mm -hmm. for us. Not a third person. Not right. a third person. More like a power. Sounds like but a very personal power. I'll just throw this in for you. Unitarians tend to go from one extreme to the other. We all do. Okay, there's no third person. Well, this is strictly power. Right. Wait a minute. Your spirit is coming to me across the screen now. Very mm. personal, but not another person from you. So that's one of my... It sounds two. like an extension, like a prolongation. Totally. totally right. You're helping oh. me. Thank you. All righty. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much. We could do this all night, but I'm sure uh, some of us will fall asleep. Uh, thank you. Very interesting, both of you. Uh, we have a lot of questions. Oh, wow. So if you could please, pretty please, <laughs> try and keep it brief. Try mm. and keep your uh, questions brief and your answers wow. brief, please. And uh, Dr. Andani, I hope you can appreciate that most of the questions are for you, because mm. obviously most of our viewers are uh, like-minded and a lot of Christians out there. So yes. well, we can just sit, let Sir Anthony answer those yeah. questions too. No, no. <laughs> no Islamic, I don't you. think so. <laughs> yeah, We won't let you get away with that. <laughs> All right. First question, Dr. Andani, what is the death? What is the destiny of the uh, dead? So what happens when you die? Do you, uh, we've heard that uh, your body goes to the grave and is somehow still alive. 
but your spirit or your soul goes somewhere else. So what happens to, to us when we die? So there is no stand, there is no one Muslim answer on this question. Mm -hmm. uh, you ask one type of Sunni Muslims, they'll say that well, this is just one type of answer. You, you're in your body, in your, the, your body's buried and your soul is in your body. Uh, and if you did good, it's going to be a pleasant experience. And if you did bad, it'll be a painful experience. And then on the day of judgment, which is some future time, you'll be judged. That's one view. Yeah. Um, another view, which is a more spiritual view that you find among uh, Sufis and Ismailis, is that uh, your physical body is, is gone. It's going to decompose. Uh, your soul is eternal. It's spiritual. It's immaterial. Your soul cannot die. And there is an intermediary body that you okay. will go through, or what you call okay. an astral body or an imaginal body. And uh, that intermediary body uh, will, will be in an intermediary realm. Uh, it's called Barzakh in Arabic. And there will be a partial reward or, or, or punishment in this intermediary okay. realm. Mm -hmm. uh, but it's not that God, again, this is a more spiritual view. In the more spiritual view, God is not actively punishing or rewarding. Um, God is God, and God is always emanating his grace on everyone. Mm -hmm. But if you lived with virtue in this world and knowledge, you will perceive God's grace as light. Yes. If you lived in an evil way full of mm -hmm. vices and ego, you will perceive God's light as a painful fire. Oh, wow. Yeah. So that's a more spiritual view. Yeah. Uh, but there is this idea that even if you are in fire after death, that is a, uh, you could call a remedial fire. Mm -hmm. So the Quran talks about hellfire as, as something that cleanses yes. you. Uh, so there's this idea that many Muslim thinkers accept uh, that eventually hell will, not everyone, but a good number, hell will cool. The fires of hell will be blown out. Yep. And everyone at the end of the day will enter paradise in the presence of God's light. Okay. Everybody, um, universalism. Yes, mm -hmm. there is a strong, there, there is a view of that. It's not unanimous, but yeah. there, are, there is a view of this. Mm -hmm. certainly. Thank you. Uh, Anton, you want to give us your perspective on what happens to the... Uh, yeah, person? I mean, there are similarities there. We are against the idea of, of permanent uh, conscious torment for anybody, including the devil. We think that's unthinkable. But we're of the so-called conditional immortality school, which says that the soul is not naturally immortal. That's, I'm sure, as uh, Dr. Andani knows, is more or less common common thing among Christian scholars these days. The immortal soul idea, we think, comes from Plato. So when the person dies, the soul really means a person. Eight souls survived on the flood. Eight persons, that is. The soul dies, and you're dead. You're unconscious. You're sleeping. Daniel 12, verse 2. Daniel is our favorite text there or Ecclesiastes, where nothing is known in Hades, where everybody goes. It's gravedom. I like that term. It's gravedom. The whole bunch of graves seen as huge gravedom, from which you emerge only by resurrection. And maybe you can detail this more for us. When that happens, for us at the parousia, at the second, the one second coming of Jesus, the saints of all the ages, Abraham and Isaac and Jacob, and all the good people, will be in that first resurrection, awaking from the sleep of death. All right, um, Dr. Andani, what, what is the destiny of Jesus and Muhammad? So yeah, we've heard okay. that mm. uh, many Muslims believe in a paru, what the New Testament calls parousia, a coming of Christ. So what happens at that time when Jesus comes back? And what about Muhammad? Is yes. there any more to Muhammad's story? <laughs> okay, a great, great question. So first... Yes. Um, Again, there are different Muslim views on the second coming of Jesus. Uh, most Sunnis believe in it. To what degree they say it's literal or symbolic varies, but the Sunni literature has almost like a, a whole end time story and, mm. and where Jesus plays a role. Uh, you heard it from Adnan the other day, so I'm not going to repeat okay. too much, but it's this idea that uh, Jesus will come down from heaven and he will join a righteous Muslim leader called the Mahdi. This is the Sunni version. Yes. And the yes. Mahdi and Jesus together will sort of vanquish the Antichrist yep. from the earth. They will together set up a reign of 
peace and enlightenment, and they'll prepare the world for the last judgment. Uh, and Jesus yep. will then die a natural death and, and so on. Um, Jesus, of course, when he comes back in the Sunni view, he will uphold the message of Muhammad and he'll sort of correct what people yep. believe falsely about him and, and so on. He'll say, you know, my God, like, you know, worship my God and your God, the yep. one God and so on. So that's one view. Now, there's another view of, of the second coming of Jesus. So one of the Quranic names for Jesus is the spirit of God. Mm. Like it's a Quranic term for him. So the Ismailis, for example, this is, this is the branch of Islam that I belong to. The Ismailis don't see Jesus' second coming as the literal coming of a person. They say that this is the coming of the Spirit, mm -hmm. which means the Holy Spirit, the divine power by which God guides people, that will become, in some future time, that will become more available to humankind. Uh, so the second coming of Jesus, because one of Jesus' names is the Spirit, it refers to that, that yep. the Spirit of God becomes available. Now, what about Muhammad? Well, yeah. I didn't get into this, but I can just mention it briefly now. Many Muslims, Sunni and Shia, all the Shia Muslims, all the Sufi Muslims, and, and many Sunnis are, are Sufi. Uh, uh, point of fact, the majority of Muslims for the last 1,000 years have been Sufi Muslims. That is, okay. Muslims with a mystical inclination. Yep. So the Shia, the Sufi, and just many, non, many Sunnis have this belief that Prophet Muhammad as a human was the manifestation of, uh, of a spirit or a spiritual light that God created before the world. Somewhat Aryan-like, if yep. I use your term. Yep. Uh, so there's this notion of a pre-existent yep. spirit of Muhammad, light of mm. Muhammad. That's and right. many Muslims believe that that, what they call it the Muhammadan light, that that Muhammadan light was manifested. And I, I, don't, I don't say incarnate. It didn't become flesh. It right. was reflected in many humans throughout history, including Jesus. Right, including Moses, including Abraham, and then it mm. was it was manifest through the person of Muhammad, and Shias believe that it continues to be manifest through their imams, their descendants of Muhammad. Sufis believe that the light of Muhammad is manifest through a, another set of spiritual guides mm -hmm. that they follow. So, in that perspective, Muhammad only left this world physically, yes. but Muhammad's spirit very close to this notion that that sir anthony talked about that the spirit of christ is present yep. so many muslims believe that the spirit of muhammad is present not just as a spirit but through other humans who are the successors yep. of muhammad so muhammad in that sense is still he never really left he's still mm -hmm. here all right thank you um let's see dr antani is the quran free of error as claimed in Surah 85, 21 and 22, uh, when Surah 41 has an eight-day eight creation. So a couple of things. So I guess you're talking about like the six day, the, 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 there's, there's numerous Quranic verses that say God created the heavens and the earth in six days. There's another verse uh, that doesn't actually say the word eight day. It just has like a longer description or X took two days, like mountains took two days, and earth took X days. And, and if you add it up in a certain way, you might get eight. <laughs> um, but it doesn't actually say eight. So there's no, on the surface, there's no contradiction. But I, I, let me share something about this. So according to the Ismaili school of Islam, uh, this is not, this verse should not be taken literally. The six days is not six 24-hour periods, and the heavens and the earth is not even the physical heavens and the earth. According to the Ismailis, this says the real meaning of the verse is God manifested his religion, the monotheistic religion, mm -hmm. through six great prophets. Mm -hmm. Adam, can... Noah, Abraham, mm -hmm. Moses, Jesus, and Muhammad. Mm -hmm. Those are the six days. Okay. Yep. So that's what the whole verse means, that God, yep. God manifested the religion of monotheism through six prophets. Mm -hmm. So the verse should not be taken as a, as a creation because other Quranic verses say that when God creates, he says, be, and yeah. it is. So why is it, be, and it is, is instant. So now why is it taking six days? Like did, did like the power run out or something? So, so that's how <laughs> you can sort of reconcile uh, yeah. God, God, God's creation descriptions in mm -hmm. the Quran. Just a follow up to that. Um, mm -hmm. 
so we've heard that a caliph or caliph, caliph. is it Uthman? Uthman in the seventh century ordered a single canonical copy of the Quran and destroyed all known copies at that time. Is that story true? Well, it's certainly true that prior to Uthman, the, the Quran originates from Muhammad's lips as oral recitation. Mm. Uh, it is what you could today call spoken word. Mm. The Quran is not organically something read. Just like the gospel preached by Jesus was oral. Yep. And it was originally the gospel, the, the message of Jesus was passed orally. It gets written down at Absolutely. a later stage. Absolutely. So that's what the Quran is. And the thing about the Quran is that this is a 23-year conversation between God via Muhammad, the community, and others. Mm -hmm. So the conversation changes depending on the ground conditions. It's, it's like... Uh, if you guys use Google Maps, so mm -hmm. use Google Maps, it's speaking to you orally, basically. Mm -hmm. There may be a map, but you're listening to it orally. And then depending on how you turn, the, the oral guidance changes. It's like, mm -hmm. oh, like change the route here. Oh, there's a, the, the bridge is closed. It changes you real time. So the Quran operates like that. I see. Right? The guidance was changing based on, well, is Muhammad's community being attacked? Mm -hmm. Or is it peaceful? Did somebody ask a question to Muhammad? Then the Quran will answer it. So that's what the Quran is. It's an oral discourse. And people memorized it. Memorization is, is a very sort of common thing in that culture. And they recited it again as a form of prayer. So lit it's liturgical. And people had written down parts of the Quran and people had memorized it. So you could say that when Muhammad died, there was no physical written Quran. There was a very diffused Quran. Mm -hmm. Parts are written, parts are oral. And that was entirely normal because if the Quran is not written, it doesn't mean in a Muslim view, it doesn't mean it's not a revelation. Like it's for something to be a revelation. It doesn't have to be like this pocket book. Like we would, right. So what Uthman did is that uh, you could say he standardized the written form of the Quran. Just the how, written. How, how did he do that is the question. He formed a committee. So he formed a committee of several people who were contemporary with Muhammad who had memorized the Quran. And this is a purely human project, by the way, right? Like Muslims don't say that God told Uthman to do this. This is a human project. Mm -hmm. They formed a committee. Uh, they called witnesses for every verse and everything that passed their standard was then written down in Arabic text. And, and you don't really have much Arabic writing. The Quran is pretty much the first Arabic book like, as mm. a whole. Mm. So, so Uthman standardized it. Now, the mm. thing is this, um, that this standard version of the Quran, it comes around 645, 650. Muhammad died in 632. So that's a very quick turnaround as far as scriptures go, right? The other scriptures of other world religions are not sort of canonized like that quickly. The Bible, mm. the gospels mm. are not. So this is sort of unusual. It happened mm. quick. And what now is the Quran free of error? Um, I can say this much that obviously uh, what you have is you have one written version that goes back to Uthman and historians generally can, uh, can verify this. There's a lot of evidence that points to the fact that the Quranic text we have today does go back to Uthman. At the very least, it goes back to the year 650. Mm. And Muslim tradition says that's when it happened. But uh, there are, in manuscripts, the scribe will sometimes write the wrong thing, right? Like any scribe. In fact, Uthman reportedly sent four copies of the Quran to four cities. And among these copies, there are some scribal errors. Yep. Because the written form of the Quran is a human product. Yep. The, the, what Muslims are supposed to believe is that it's the Quran as recited, like that's the revelation. The written form is almost like a human attempt to contain that. So humans being fallible scribes, they'll make errors when they write it down. And, and, and we have Obviously. Quranic manuscripts, where something is erased and, and stuff like yeah. that. So, so right. that, that would be my yep. response. Yeah. Thank you. Anthony, uh, briefly, is the Bible, just to be fair, is the Bible free of error? <laughs> uh, no, it's not. We don't use the phrase inerrant. 
because we've got different manuscripts. So who's going to decide which is the errant, inerrant one? We simply talk about the authority of scripture. Our premise is that if you don't have scripture, you've got nothing to talk about. You must have a written record. And Peter and Paul speak about scripture. And they may have argued about which books came later and so on, should be in or should be out. That's not the point for us. Scripture was a, a, a measurable unit for Paul and Peter. And Jesus is tremendously scripture oriented. He simply says it's written. So I think they're all biblicists very strongly, those people. But inerrancy is a bad word because people meet and say, well, which, which manuscript are you talking about? And there are lots of variations. Some of them completely spurious, like the Trinitarian verse in 1 John 5, 7, which everybody knows is a forgery. And I, I, I offer this to, to my colleague, teach you for your students. In the NIV, the nearly inspired version, said to be humorously, the nearly inspired version, the NIV, Jesus is said to be going back to the Father. He never said that. He's going to the Father. There's a huge difference between going back to England and going to England. So there are crime scenes, we call them crime scenes, which are blatant forgeries and corrected by the best commentaries, which still get it right. So I want to throw that in there. All right. Uh, let's see. Anthony, uh, mm. what do you think about some scholars? I believe James Dunn held to this view, who say that the author of Luke uh, mm. and Acts who was Luke, uh, does not represent the death of Jesus as atoning sacrifice. Oh, I just don't believe that because I think that Luke was on the same page as the others. I, he may not have written about that, but so what? I doubt very much that Luke was not in good contact with Paul. Paul, I, I did think, I do think, believed in substitution in terms. So I really don't get into this, uh, those areas. Maybe we should, maybe I'm being careless and dismissive here. But a lot of theological discussion is a frightful waste of time, I think. The question is, what does the text say? It actually says that Jesus is going to rule the world. As you watch the news today, <laughs> you're very, I'm very conscious of the anarchy. The gospel of the kingdom for us, which is our central point, the gospel of the kingdom is Jesus coming back, thy kingdom come, to fix this world. But not only that, you fixing it with him. It's a training school. We talk about Navy SEALs. The gospel is inv inviting people through testing and trial now in order to make the world work as it was intended to work. And the devil will be bound at that point in our classic premillennialism. So I wanted my colleague to hear that, that uh, idea. A uh, question for both. First, Dr. Andani, why does the Quran condone slavery? I'm not an expert on this topic of slavery. Uh, Jonathan Brown is an academic scholar who just wrote a book on, on Islam and mm. slavery. But all, what I'll simply say is that slavery existed just as a social fact uh, in late antiquity. It existed before the Quran. Uh, nobody really questioned it. And mm. obviously, you know, uh, historically, we, this human race has been capable of all kinds of injustices. You know, let's yes. be fair. Uh, and we, as we, we are all sort our, our ancestors are, are responsible for doing all sorts of harm on, on other people. That's right. Um, I think what's happening in the Quran, and this is not just for slavery, but for any topic, the Quran is starting uh, where people are at. Mm. Right. So it, mm. it, for whatever reason, the Quran can't do away with the entire social order, but it has to start within the social That's order right. and then make adjustments. So, yep. yes, the Quran does not condemn slavery, but it certainly encourages manumission. Mm. Uh, there is a specific verse that says if 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 a slave, if your servant or slave comes and like asks for a written manumission, then do it. OK. Uh, so the, the 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 freeing of a slave is mentioned in the Quran as like one among the different good deeds that can help you attain salvation. Uh, so I would argue the Quran is starting with this social situation, but it's uh, people call this trajectory hermeneutics that the trajectory of the Quran is mm -hmm. towards a more equitable order where you yeah, have good. less slavery or no slavery. Mm -hmm. That's, that's how, how I've come to understand, but I'm not an expert on yeah. the topic. So I would refer readers to, mm -hmm. to other books on right. this. Anthony, where does the Bible condone slavery? 
Um, I don't think it condones that. Slavery word is a, is a loaded term. If you mean an employer-employee relationship, I, I think Paul doesn't as exactly as Dr. Adani said. The, the, ownership, the ownership of human mm. beings. Well, you can treat them well. Paul doesn't tell the, any of the Christians to give up on, on that arrangement. He says that the Christian masters should t- treat their servants, slaves, rightly. So I don't think Paul worried about that. You couldn't, as you said, you can't change the social order like that. Paul doesn't try to do it, but there's a way of being a, quote, slave owner, which is compatible with Christian ethics, Paul. Uh, let's see. Dr. Andani, do you believe in takia? Uh, what does the person mean by this? Because this term takia today is so mis, it's so abused and misused. Yeah, can you, what can you mean? please explain what takia is? Sure, okay. So, uh, takia is a practice by which uh, a believer could hide the fact that they have a particular religious belief in order to avoid being harmed by an oppressor. That is what takia is historically. Now, as a point of fact, um, in the Quran, we find many references to the fact that Muhammad's followers in Mecca were being tortured, persecuted, pressured, beaten to give up their mm. belief and practice of monotheism. Mm-hmm. Mecca was an, was ruled by idol, uh, by idol worshippers and Muhammad's message of, look, there's only one God, the idols are false. Remember, the idols are also like the biggest revenue bringers to Mecca, right? People would visit <laughs> yeah. to give homage to idols, give offerings. So by Muhammad preaching monotheism, yes, bad for business. Uh, it's a threat to the established order. So Muhammad's message is not just theological, it's a social justice message too. So as a result of that, um, the powerful Meccan aristocrats tortured and threatened many of Muhammad's early followers. They said they were basically being forced, like give up your religion or we're mm. going to beat you in this. So the Quran talks about how one believer under, under torture yeah. outwardly recanted his faith. Like he said, Oh, I, I don't believe in Muhammad because he was being like killed. Yeah. Yeah. And the Quran says, that's okay. okay. Like God knows, God knows what's in the person's heart. Yeah. If you have yeah. to save your body from harm, you can do it. Now, after now, eventually this thing stops because Muhammad becomes more politically secure and his community becomes more secure. But after Muhammad dies, Muslim minority communities like the Shia and the Ismailis, they live in societies that are ruled by a Sunni dynasty with an army that sometimes goes out to hunt down the Shia. Hmm. So a Shia Muslim was permitted if they were asked, are you a Shia or Sunni? They were permitted to say, I'm Sunni. So they're not killed. That is what Takiya is. That is what it is historically. So Mm -hmm. Sunnis generally never did Takiya because their lives were never under threat. So would would you do it today, say, if you found yourself in in a similar circumstance? I I think that's a question. Even today, most, like, Shia and Sunni today, because we live in nation states generally, which have laws and yep. law and order, at least I hope we do. So generally it's not <laughs> like nobody really has to do it, but you know, in some places uh, when you had, if you have a Sunni militia going to hunt an, a Muslim minority, uh, it would be justified for a family to say, yeah, we're, t- we're not Shia. Yep. And then they live. That's okay. Yep. Uh, what I want to say is, Unfortunately, there are um, Islamophobes and there are also some Christian apologists who take this concept of taqiyya and redefine it to mean Muslims in America pretending to be peaceful when they actually mm. want to commit violence. Now, that is not what taqiyya is. Like, that has nothing right. to do with taqiyya. That's just subterfuge, right? Mm, That's right. a completely different thing. But, thank so, you, uh, Doctor. Yeah. We, we got a couple more questions Mm -hmm. i'm just trying to get them in thanks to everyone out there we got a a big viewership so a lot of questions uh try and keep it brief anthony uh what sparked your interest in the unitarian or non-trinitarian view 
Um, my experience in the Church of England knowing nothing and going in search of answers. And I will have to say the influence from Cambridge, where my cousin J.A.T. Robinson was notorious for being a Unitarian, human face of God, uh, Morris Wiles and others. There was a very strong Cambridge influence, and there still is. See, I would contend that people, I, I wouldn't contend, I would state that Isaac Newton was a Unitarian. So was John Locke, and so was John Milton. So was Andrews Norton. It's simply false to say Unitarians are unschooled. They don't know what they're talking about. Why don't they believe the Trinity? That would be to discard a whole lot of scholarly literature. So being a university person myself, one tries to keep an eye on what other scholars are doing. So that sparks my interest. And I'm thrilled to hear that this, we have this so, in common. So Anthony, I think the, the question also, so mm -hmm. did you, uh, I guess, uh, did the Trinity ever make sense to you? Did you even bo uh, no, at that have, no. time bother no. studying it or? Wouldn't have cared didn't okay. know what it was. We heard the word, we, heard, we sang the hymns about okay. holy, holy, holy. But at that, uh, as mm -hmm. C.S. Lewis put it well, I like this phrase. C.S. Lewis says that the religion that I was brought up in had about as much moral authority as Father Christmas. <laughs> That's well. All right. Uh, Dr. Antani, how does Islam define sin? Uh, is, yeah. is it a violation of the pillars, the pillars of Islam, or is it something more specific? Again, many, many different definitions depending on what time period, what source we're talking about. Mm -hmm. Uh, so all sorts of things could be sin, um, you know, violating what God has commanded you to do as obligatory. If you don't meet an obligation, uh, that could be a sin. Uh, if you, if you sort of, there's a set of acts in the Quran uh, that are called sins, like taking a life uh, that's mm. sacred without just cause, you know, mm. that's a sin. Sin is also likened in the Quran to debt. So it's like you wrong somebody. Mm. Right. So now you sort of owe them a debt. Uh, so th there's many different, like, there, I can't really give you a standard answer. Um, vices, different vices, mm. like what the Christian tradition identifies as vices, those mm. are sins mm. as well. But the biggest sin uh, the Quran says is to, you know, join something onto God, which is called shirk. Yes. But this is not simply about idol worship because two verses of the Quran say rhetorically, have you seen the person who makes his ego like God. Okay. Nice. That's the worst sin, right? Yes. To, to treat your own yes. individual finite self, ego, opinions nice as God-like. Uh, nice that, that is like really the chief sin mm. that we want to. Thank you. Uh, Anthony, how, does, yeah. how do you define sin according to your understanding of the Bible? Well, sin is, is the classic verse is the one in John there. Sin is the transgression of the Torah, but you must then define what you mean by Torah. The, New Testament, the Bible is clearly two covenants. There's an Old Testament covenant, the law of Moses. The Torah of Moses is not, I repeat, not, not, not what Christians should be doing. The Torah of Messiah, that's Paul's phrase, and Paul is very, very radical. He says, I'm a Jew but I'm not under the law of Moses, but I am within the Torah of Messiah. So I wish the public would hear that clearly because there's a huge muddle in the faith right now. People are trying to keep the Sabbath and observe the food laws, which they have freedom to do if they want to, but don't kid themselves. That's not the law of Messiah developed, I think, both by Jesus and Paul. That's my answer there. Sin is the transgression of the Torah of Messiah. Right, the the teachings of Jesus, whatever yes, he absolutely. says, absolutely, and his apostles, obviously, and the apostles. Uh, yep. Doctor Andani, I think you mentioned the Talmud earlier, and you mentioned that in reference to supporting the fact that Jesus was killed. So the question is, doesn't the Talmud say that Jesus was stoned, not crucified? Yes. Talmud. The Talmud does say, like, like, there's an account in the Talmud, and it's fictional, right? Like, it's not mm. a real, it's not a historical account. But what's important is that the Talmud claims that it not the Romans didn't crucify Jesus. The uh, Jewish authorities, the mm. rabbinical authority, they put Jesus on trial. Yes. And then they killed him according to Jewish law. Yes. Which is stoning. Now, this is not true historically, but the Talmud claims it. 
Mm. Uh, and in the same breath, the Talmud accuses Mary of being an adulteress. Oh. Now, really? the Quran, yeah. in my estimation, and you don't have to agree with me, but if you read the Quran in a 7th century context, right, and not in a 9th or 10th century context, the Quran uh, is, is clearly responding to the Talmud. Mm. And it's saying, you, ye who, who want to take credit for killing Jesus <laughs> and for accusing his mother of being, being an adulteress, you're wrong. You didn't kill Jesus. You're not responsible for mm. killing Jesus. God will, you know, God allowed that yeah, okay. to happen. Yeah. Interesting. Thank you. Mm. Uh, let's see. Okay. Final question. Uh, it's mm. 10 p.m. here in Atlanta. Mm. Yeah. So final question for both of you. Anthony first, please. Mm -hmm. Anthony, if God knows everything mm. and everything is according to his will, mm. What is the point of life? Uh, if he already knows everything about the past, present, and future. Well, I, I don't accept the premise because that would be stark Calvinism, what he called the decretum horribile, that God has determined before they're born the fate of everybody. To me, that's the ultimate bad doctrine. No, there's a degree of free will. I don't have free will to do something in the American state. I'm not even a citizen. I'm enjoying the freedom of being a green card person, certain things I can't do, but I think I have a great range of freedom. We all do. So if that's a, a sort of an anti-Calvin answer, I'm coming strongly against the Ayatollah of Geneva, who for me was a murderous individual, and I'm not pleased that he murdered Servetus for the issue of the Trinity. Dr. Andani, I don't, I'm not familiar with the Islamic <laughs> view and Allah, if Allah knows all and et cetera, but what would you say to that? Oh, I have one quick request. I, there was a question in the YouTube chat, which was deleted, but somebody was asking about Quranic violence. Yeah. I think that they like posted a verse, uh, a partial verse. And can I quickly address that? Mm -hmm. Is that okay? Uh, what was it? I didn't they, see it. So they posted Quran 2, 191, the, the so-called... It begins, it says, kill. Oh, the, the sword, the... Um... So some sword verse, if they... I yeah. just wanted to quickly... Yeah, go ahead. Can I do that? Please. Okay. So, Please. so I'm just going to quickly screen share. This is very quickly. Thank mm. you for letting me do that. So two, you can see on my screen here, uh, this verse 2191. So we're 2191. And kill them wherever you overtake them and expel them from wherever they have expelled you. And fitna is worse than killing. This was posted in the chat. Yep. Uh, almost as if, oh, why is the Quran commanding all-out mm. violence, right? But mm. go right, firstly, go right before. And it says, this is 2190. Fight in the way of Allah those who fight you, but do not transgress. Mm. Allah does not like transgressors. Mm. So these two verses, firstly, are about defensive warfare. Because it says, fight those who fight you and then don't transgress, which means like, don't start, don't start violence. Mm -hmm. And this second verse is talking about if they are fighting you, then you're allowed to fight back. Yep. So if they, if they expel you, and, and, and this is very contextual because it's talking about in Arabia, uh, in Mecca, Mecca was seen as a place where you're not allowed to, ha you're not allowed to fight. Mm. Like no fighting allowed. Mm. Uh, but the question was, what if the pagans attacked Muhammad's community in Mecca? Mm. Are they allowed to fight back? So this verse is saying, if they fight you yeah. in Mecca, then you can fight back. Yeah. Okay. Right. So that's what that is. That that's about. I just wanted to oh, clarify right. that. Yeah. Um, well, I, mm. actually, that brings me to probably our final question. Mm. Um. How how would you harmonize? I have heard Shabir Ali, right, a, a prominent apologist for many decades now. Anthony mm. uh, debated him long ago. Yep. I, I heard him say once, uh, Dr. Andani, that Jesus was a nonviolent uh, teacher. He taught about nonviolence. He taught about loving your enemies and so forth. So uh, that's our understanding of Jesus, by the way. That's why... Our ministry, uh, we have a website called ChristEnemyLove.com that we teach uh, uh, people how to be nonviolent in this world, which is probably the most difficult thing, uh, as you can appreciate. So how 
do we harmonize that aspect of Jesus as a prophet of Allah, as you, as you believe, and Muhammad and his followers who clearly were, were people of the sword or, or however. So, so how do we harmonize those two? So you have a prophet preaching what looks like total nonviolence to the point of death, and then you have uh, Muhammad and his followers. Well, firstly, I would oppose this characterization that Muhammad and his followers are people of the sword. I mean, I think it's a completely ridiculous char characterization. Uh, it, it's polemical. Because anyone who sort of studies the life of Muhammad, firstly, for, for about 12 years, they are practicing nonviolence, like mm. in Mecca, where they're, they're vulnerable, mm. uh, right? And when that, that nonviolent practice, and, and interesting, the word jihad is used in the Meccan verses of the Quran mm. to mean nonviolent resistance. Like yeah. the verb jihad is used to mean that. Now, what happens is uh, they, they are in, they are, they're getting harmed, right, by the Meccans. So the first reaction is not to fight back. It's to leave. A bunch of Muslims go to Abyssinia where the Meccans chase them. And it's the Christian king of Abyssinia who says to the Meccans, you can't touch these guys. Mm. They're very, their beliefs are very close to mine. So the first response by Muhammad, first it was nonviolence. That didn't work. Because remember, Muhammad has a duty to protect his community. God is the ultimate protector, we would all agree. But God works through his chosen humans. So if God says, I will protect the believers, that actually is Muhammad's job. Muhammad has to protect. Mm. But even when Muhammad protects, violence was the last resort. So first, they nonviolent resistance didn't work. Then flee, like migration. Yeah. So they first went to Abyssinia. They, it didn't work out. Then they go to Medina, right? That's called mm. the Hijra. So in 622, mm. Muhammad and, fall, and, and, you know, they had to sneak out of Mecca an assassination attempt the the night muhammad left mecca all the tribes sent an assassin to his bed to kill him and mm -hmm. muhammad knew this so his cousin ali slept in his bed oh, yeah. right so so his life was at stake so he moves and the whole community moves with him to medina and he's invited to medina because medina is full of warring clans and they heard muhammad is a peaceful man so they said muhammad come and, and make, make peace for all of us, like arbitrate our conflict. So that's what Muhammad does. Now, then what happens is the Meccans put a bounty on Muhammad. And they tell the tribes of Medina, give Muhammad up, or we're going to come kill you guys. Mm -hmm. I mean, this is what the sources say. So Muhammad only has to resort to violence as a defensive right. measure. And we need right. to keep in mind that in Arabia, um, they didn't practice eye for an eye. They practiced like 500 eyes for an eye. Like <laughs> the tribal warfare was so bad. If one person dies by accident, they wouldn't demand like one equivalent. Another mm -hmm. tribe would be like, we'll kill 500. Right. And the Quran responds to the 500 eyes for an eye by saying, no, eye for an eye is fine. And if you can forgive them, that's even better. So right. I would say that this sort of nonviolence is the goal. You cannot practice nonviolence if there's nobody left to practice nonviolence. And I would sure. take a contemporary example um, with all due respect mm. to, to both of you, but pacifism would not work to defeat the Nazis. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It would not work to defeat the communists, right? Yeah, yeah, uh, it doesn't work on a, on a world or universal that. level. Yeah. Right, uh, that's right. What, that's why there are a few who are called out but the point was, um, Dr. Andani, that the last resort, according to un our understanding of Jesus and his apostles, yeah. the last resort was love your enemy, even unto death. So right. that's, that was where the question was coming from. I understand that um, Muhammad, uh, I've heard this argument that, well, he had to resort to self, basically lethal self-defense which is the position of the majority of Christendom, which we mm. di disagree with vehemently, this ministry. And we're, we're few, we're rare, but we believe that Jesus' last resort was love to, of enemy till the end. So 
Uh, again, I just wanted to make again, that clear. With all, again, with all respect to you and your ministry, and, and I, I think like we idea what you're preaching is an ideal, right? I think it's well. It's, I think it's for, Jesus. But, it, it's Jesus teachings, and that's what we're trying to follow. Well, that's totally fine. I just think but that if you were out with your, if if somebody tried to like sure, sure. hurt your family, yeah. sure. uh, I would. You would. You probably use violence to stop somebody from yeah. from hurting your family. So yep. all I'm yep. saying is that. Um, from from a from a Muslim perspective, from a Quranic perspective, uh, mm -hmm. there are what you could say several values that have to be practiced, and one of the values is peace, but sure. the other value is sort of protection, yep. responsibility, oh, and yeah. Muhammad mm -hmm. had to sort of practice both. Yep. All right. Thank, Thank you, you. Anthony. I'll Thank give you. you the last word on this topic if you want. Uh, um, I don't know that I have anything fine. more to add. If, if people wanted to know the sort of uh, non uh, conscientious objection point of view, I wrote an article when I was getting my degree in theology called Christian Suicide Must Stop. My strongest argument was that in international wars, Christians kill each other. I made the point that, that Wesleyan ministers are not allowed to bear arms. What are we saying there? Why don't we let the clergy bear arms? What are we saying? It seems obscene for the clergy to kill each other. It seems to me, and I can be wrong here, but it seems very odd for Christians to be killing each other in war. So, all right. Thank you, Anthony. Thank you, Dr. Andani, Thank for you. your time you. And, you, and, your, and your lesson. You have educated a, a lot of us, I think, on, on your views. No, I'm you. honored to, to, to share this, this time. Thank no, you. thank you. And we might Likewise. do this again, maybe. Uh, we'll see. Yeah, so yeah. here's uh, Anthony's article towards yep, the cessation of church suicide yep. and Dr. Andani's uh, YouTube uh, videos. If yes. you'd like to find out more about his, uh, let's call it, brand of, uh, of uh, Islam. Yeah. So. Thank you once again to both. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you, Carlos. Bye bye.